I hold these uh, regularly throughout the year, so this will definitely not be your last chance. We try to get them out at, I don't know, every six weeks or eight weeks or so. Um, and we move them to, sometimes we move them to different venues, different times of the day. Sometimes we'll have one at 10 in the morning that attracts a crowd that prefers to come out during the day. Sometimes we do an evening one like this, or maybe we'll try, uh, we did one at Jenny's Park one time during the evening and had some ice cream for the kids, for maybe families that wanted to come. So we try to just do different things so different people in different situations can um, come out and participate. So I appreciate uh, you all coming out tonight. This is great. Uh, and hopefully you get a chance to see the building. Maybe you haven't been in here before. Um, and so what coffee clashes are designed for is, you know, I do a state of the city every year, which is a great time for me to talk for about 40, 45 minutes and give you an update on all the, that's kind of an exhaustive update on everything going on in the city and what's coming for the next year. Um, of course, at city council meetings, of which we have one tonight at seven, any citizen on the second or fourth Monday can come and uh, ask questions of the city council uh, at that time or state things, you have up to three minutes. So there's that venue. <clears throat> And then um, there's a whole host you know, of other venues where you can give input. We're gonna have a series of about five community meetings you can keep an eye open for uh, May. These are largely staff-driven meetings, but where we're gonna go out to different, uh, we kind of divided the city up into five different areas, go out for like hour-long listening sessions uh, in those as well. That'll be an opportunity to maybe ask planning staff some more things. I'm gonna try to go to as many of those as I can. I don't know that I can make every one of them, but. Um, so that's another opportunity for input. But the coffee clash is really kind of an idea that's just strictly, you know, I could sit here and talk for an hour if you want me to, but that's really not preferable to me because I can do that on several occasions. Usually what happens in a coffee clash is after the intro, the rest of the hour is taken up by Q&A. And that's really what they're designed for. So you get an opportunity to ask what's important to you or maybe just share some insights on what's important to you. Um, and so that's what it's about. So. I'll start with uh, just, yeah, go ahead, and if you have a question, raise your hand, and then we'll just go from there, and we'll, and we'll introduce Congresswoman Del Benny and, and, and incorporate her in as soon as she comes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hey, Deborah Cavendish. Um, I live over by 47th and 4th, and I wanted to get an idea what you have planned, what's in the agenda for the homeless, mm -hmm. um, drugs, and um, um, so, that, that's my thing, because I have incidents that happen. Yep. I used to live for almost six years on the 9th and State. Yep. So... Good question. I, I, I feel like things are going to go downhill this year, and I don't want to feel like that, because I am the hopeless optimist. But um, I want to know what's on the agenda for these guys, because let me share with you. <clears throat> Um, Mid-March, I was driving northbound on state, it was around 10, 11 o'clock, I had an appointment up at Smoky Point, and I saw homeless men that did not, they were dressed as homeless, but they did not look homeless. They were well-groomed, they were well-fed, and so they stuck out like a sore thumb. Grant you, I'm a retired bus driver, so, you know, I pay attention to things. And so that really concerned me. So I feel like I'm singing to the choir, but I want to share that with you. Yep. Very good question. So a really, really good question. This is, so homelessness and drugs and mental health, and a lot of times they all go together, right, is the single biggest issue facing uh, local, state, and frankly, federal, I'm sure Congresswoman Dobene would say federal governments across the nation right now. It's particularly acute in areas um, like the Puget Sound when you run up an, along I-5. Um, and so whether you're in Marysville or Arlington, Smoky Point area, or Everett or Linwood or Seattle or Tacoma, you know, you're gonna see this up and down I-5. And so you are spot on. It's a question that we wrestle with every single day, the city council and I, our city staff, our police department, as do a lot of other local governments. Um, I've, I'm part of, I co-lead a, bipartisan group of mayors in Snohomish County, 16 mayors, Mayor Franklin of Everett and I co-lead it. Um, that is a group of mayors that are trying to tackle this problem and you know, really work with the state legislature, the county prosecutors, um, the, the social services network in the county to try and find solutions. So what are the solutions? Well, if there was a magic solution, yeah, we would all be uh, implementing it right now and this would be taken care of. But there are, I think, solutions. There are some that some cities are trying that I think we need a better statewide uh, 
um, collaboration on, and there are others that are ideas that we think could work. So when you go, when you deal with, I'll just speak to Marysville homeless. When our officers deal with Marysville homeless, what we find is the majority of them, not all of them, the majority of them though have a mental health and a drug problem, or, or a mental health or a drug problem, or both. So they need help. They need to. They don't just need to be thrown into a, um, a home. They don't just need a roof over there. They need some form of assistance to get them into a situation where they can adequately care for themselves and maybe get their job back or get back with loved ones that have maybe kind of moved them out or something like that. And so we have an embedded social worker team here that tries to do that goes out and tries to encourage them to get the help that they need to get into a drug treatment program, a mental health program, or if they don't have any of those issues, then to just try and get them housing. That um, has been fairly successful. Um, I will say, you know, in all candor, that it has been inhibited by some laws that were passed in 2021, um, where we had a little bit of a, an approach of, uh, let's say you were, you were committing crimes to feed a drug habit out there. We could say, well, um, here's a situation where you know, we can prosecute those crimes, or rather than do that, we don't really want to put you in jail, let's get you into a treatment program. And let's, get, let's, let's attack it that way, because really what we want to do is get you out of this situation and, and back into a self-sustaining lifestyle. We had put about 150 people through treatment under that program over a few years, over two, I think about three years, which is no small thing in a city of our size. It was over 150. Um, the recent state laws passed in 2021 um, well, hi, Congresswoman Dovani. <laughs> and I want to tell you that in just three months, she has been to the city of Marysville, met us here and staff. We took her on a tour of a bunch of key projects in the city of Marysville. We met with her back in Washington, D.C., and her and her staff have been incredibly responsive. Um, and so you've got a congresswoman who really cares about what's going on and cared enough to also ask hey, if you know, there's a chance that she could join here tonight. And so I thank you for doing that. And if you want to take a minute to introduce yourself, then I'll finish answering this question. Uh, that'd be great. Do you want to finish first? Or? Well, yeah, sure. I'll, yeah. Okay. Was, I don't want was, to interrupt your flow. It was on, it was so. on uh, drugs. So go and ahead. Then I'll, then I'll jump in right after. So the state laws passed in 2021. Um, and I think they were uh, well-intentioned, but had severe unintentional unintended consequences and what that did is it said you have to rather than what we were doing right we were saying hey if if we won't prosecute these crimes if you'll get into a treatment program these laws made it where you had to warn somebody in that situation let's say you, they're doing drugs publicly and they've got a rap sheet you have to warn them one time and say hey we, can we get you into treatment they say no you just they, they're released back into the community second time same thing you want to go into treatment nope released back into the community only on the third time would you have the ability to prosecute? Well, as most of you know, most people don't, first of all, hang around long enough to get that third strike, so to speak, or third warning. And so they're moving on to other cities or you know, trying to track that and get them um, caught three times is very challenging. And so what we found is we went from 150 people through treatment and that petered out to very little. Uh, the city of Everett will tell you that since that law took effect in July of 2021, they've had one person accept treatment. Mm -hmm. So Marysville put 150 through in the prior years. They've had one since that. Well, why is that, you would ask? Well, I think it's just simple. It's real simple when you think about it. It's if I don't, if I'm looking for that next high, and this is a, an issue, you know, a sickness, right? All I can think about is that. I don't want to be bothered with talking about treatment. I know you can't do anything to me because you, you've got to warn me. And they, and they know that, and we know they know that because just days after that law took effect, our chief was out riding around, saw someone slumped over in a car with another officer. They went up and they knocked on the window and they said, uh, hey, we don't want treatment. We know you can't do anything, just leave me alone. Um, so we're working with our state legislature to change those laws. I believe there will be a change this year. I believe the state legislature um, understands that. Our bipartisan group of mayors is working with four Republicans and Democrats from Snohomish County. And out of that result came Senate Bill 5536 that Senator Robinson put forward, which is a solid solution. It's not perfect, but it, it gives us a way forward. I don't know how that'll come through the House, State House, but that's one idea. The other thing, mesh houses. So we have micro-emergency shelter homes in Marysville. These are houses the city buys that we put people that have, um, tra are transitioning a bit out of this lifestyle, and we give them um, lengthy housing while they try to stabilize into housing of their own. So the beautiful thing about mesh homes is um, you know, as you are witnessing right now, you know, with some controversies, when you try to 
purchase big buildings or certain things and plop big shelters down in neighborhoods, you get a lot of, a lot of pushback. I've never had anybody complain about a mesh house. We've bought them around different areas of the neighborhood. I'm not even gonna tell you where they're at. And nobody knows where they're at. But there are people that are coming out of this lifestyle living in these city-owned mesh homes throughout the city. And they're incorporated into neighborhoods. And that's one, one way to do it. Another thing we um, do as well is we have a hotel voucher program through Link Northwest. So I got a call um, one time f that there was a mother and two or three kids living out of a car. There might, there might have been a domestic violence situation or something. Well, we can't maybe get her immediately into a mesh house or immediately into a, a, a temporary house solution, but we can at least hold it over with a couple weeks worth of vouchers. And we have a hit, that's the council approves the um, human services fund where we help fund some of those things. So we have you know, some of those temporary things and we have a mesh house system. We also have the embedded social worker system to deal with that. And we have a deal with the Everett Gospel Mission because we take a lot of people out of the Everett Gospel Mission into our mesh houses. So we don't ask what city they're from. Most of them probably aren't from Marysville, but we have a deal with them because we take people out of their mission into our home when they're ready to get into a little more stable housing that if our officers find someone on the street tonight that is willing to take shelter, they'll, they'll provide them a bed there. So those are a few of the things. There's a lot more we could talk about, a lot more that needs to be done. Um, but those are a few of the things. I hope that helps to answer your question. Maybe I'll have a follow-up later. I want to let Congressman Del Benny introduce herself first, and then we'll I get to some more. about camps, too. Homeless camps? Yes. If you see or are aware of a homeless camp, let us know. Assistant Chief Lawless is right back there. We do deal with those immediately. And what we do is go in with that same program I told you about. The embedded social worker and the officers will go in, offer services, look and see if we've got crime issues, and deal with it in the appropriate way of either hopefully getting them into treatment or mental health services. Or if, if they're on a situation where we can legally prosecute crimes and they don't want to take those services, we'll, we'll deal with it that way. Um, we don't allow people to, to camp on private property or public property for that matter. We have solutions, we have options for them, so they're not allowed to do that. We don't always know where the camps are and sometimes we'll go deal with them and they'll return. Um, there's no doubt about that, but if you could make Chief, Assistant Chief Lawless aware, um, we can work on that camp. Go ahead. Um. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. Sorry, a few minutes late. All of you know, uh, I-5 sometimes is not uh, forgiving, so uh, I don't have to tell you. We made it to Highway 2. Is that last little stretch that was uh, was holding us back? But um, um, it is great to be here. As the mayor said, the first congressional district changed with redistricting, so now goes from downtown Bellevue basically up to Arlington, and it's kind of just. Diamond shaped maybe, um, I'm trying to think of the good, there isn't really a good uh, description of, of the shape, but it goes from Arlington around the city limits of Arlington, Marysville, goes out to Mount Lake Terrace and Monroe, and then down to Bellevue. Um, so it is uh, King and Snohomish County. Um, my district used to go all the way up to the Canadian border, so it's a little bit different, but so it's great to have Marysville and Arlington, Mount Lake Terrace are all new, even Bellevue's new to the district. Um, and so really I want to one, let you know that if there's ever issues that you have that we can help with, um, please reach out to my office. My office is in Kirkland, but the website is delbene.house.com, or .gov, delbene.house.gov. Um, Rachel, who is, is from my office there, um, Rachel and Kelly is my district director. Um, both are some contacts here, but, um, but happy to help. You know, one of the big things we do, and many of you may have worked with Congressman Larson in the past too, and we've moved casework between our offices to help <laughs> things like veterans benefits or um, questions you have with any federal agency on Medicare, Social Security, on um, getting a passport, which seems to be a, a common <laughs> one right now. Any questions you have um, on, you know, with getting a response back or the IRS or something like that, um, we, can, we can be helpful, so feel free to reach out. Um, it is a, a 
challenging time in Washington, D.C. I'll be back again. Um, we go back into session on Monday. Um, but when we were talking about housing, one of the things that I think we're trying to move on and that I've been leading the effort on the House is on the low income housing tax credit. That actually helps finance affordable housing. Um, housing Hope actually just opened their Twin Lakes facility, yeah, their second wave of that. Um, the mayor and I were both there when that opened. It's beautiful, by the way. Um, and um, that was built with the low income housing tax credit because it helps provide that financing. If we can expand that, we can get 2 million more affordable homes built across the country. Um, that's thousands more um, spaces right here in Washington state. It's a bipartisan, it's bipartisan legislation, so we're gonna to continue to work on that. That's one piece um, of work that we need to do. We also, which was exciting today, um, members of Congress um, can put forward funding for community projects. Um, we put forward projects every year that um, our local communities ask us for funding for particular types of projects. And the city um, came forward with a few projects they were looking for resources for. One was um, the Grove Street overpass. Um, and uh, so we're submitting that as one of our, we get 15 projects we can submit. So hopefully until we pass a funding bill, which is uh, um, something that will take more time to get done. Uh, that money isn't available, but it is one of the projects we submitted. That just got released today, and I know yes. is an important project that the city's been working on very, for a while. We're very grateful for that, yeah. Um, so we now we just need to get it done. It's <laughs> yeah. in there, but we gotta get the bill passed um, to make that happen. So clearly the infrastructure legislation provided resources that um, we, we have resources that communities have used as a result of uh, the funds that went out during the COVID pandemic to help our, our communities. We are continue. I think it's really important that we continue to make sure we're not only building the infrastructure for the next 50 years right now, but we're investing in our communities. And infrastructure isn't just roads and bridges and overcrossings. It's also water systems, um, broadband throughout our communities. I mean, we think about infrastructure, it's pretty broad. But that a lot of the dollars, even the dollars that come through the state, are actually federal dollars that we give to the state and then the state allocates it out for projects to do important things. Um, you know, whether it's looking at the projects here in the city or bigger projects like the trestle, things like that are all things um, where federal dollars can play a key role. But I, I don't wanna, I wanna really answer any questions you might have for me um, or the mayor too, so. And I'll let the mayor, you were asking, oh. I, I shouldn't. Uh, no. <laughs> I don't know the order. My, my name is Jack Blackwell. I live in uh, Glenwood Mobile Estates. It's yeah. a, you know the place. It's yep. a 55 plus mobile home park. It was recently bought out by a multinational uh, company whose business model is to suck every dime out of the can. They are making homeless seniors. Now, in this city, our median income is about $80,000, and most of the new residential construction has been in the six hundred to $900,000 range, yep. which $80,000 will not qualify for. Right. There has been zip for affordable senior housing, and we're a growing demographic. And I don't know if you guys remember, you know, 30, 40 years ago, Great Panthers, you know, when people like me start winding up homeless, you know, the reason that the homeless demographic over 65 drops off all of a sudden is because we die. You know, we don't live. Uh, you know, something needs to be done. It needs to be addressed from both federal level and a local level. Now, I don't know if you remember 23 years ago, uh, what was it? <coughs> Kellogg Ridge, they, it was bought out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the zoning was allowed to be changed, and everybody got booted out. Now, the county <coughs> changed that, but it was too late. Too late for a lot of people. And I really hope somebody does something about what they're doing to us, because it's not just Glenwood. It's the business model is being copied all over the place. And... Uh, the Carlisle Group is the one who mainly is responsible for it, but we're getting a lot of people who are copying that business model. 
Now, if you want to send some of your staff down to 12th and Penn, uh, to, you know, go up and see the Carlisle Group. It's not their headquarters. It's a lobbying office. So, I grew yeah. up in D.C. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, so, yeah, I, I can start, and then Congressman okay. Delbeni okay. might have some some thoughts on this. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm aware these concerns, I mean, obviously we've, there's different levels, I think, of when you're talking about housing and homelessness. We just talked a little bit ago about, I think, the kind of that base level where, you know, you're just trying to kind of pick people up off the ground and get them to a point where they could even survive in a home, right? Um, if you could find them one. And then you have, I think, what you're talking about is that um, the missing middle or that group that's maybe close to being unable to afford a home one bad decision or one bad break from being homeless. And those sometimes, we gotta be careful because th those problems get neglected a little bit while we focus on the eyes on problem that's in front of all of us every time we drive down the street. We forget about maybe the folks that are you know, at home and, uh, but, but could be homeless at some point in the future. Um, you know, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you, at a local level, it's, it is frustrating there. None of us are real thrilled about seeing uh, the cheapest housing in the city go to about, I remember when the cheapest housing in the city was in the 300,000s and that was while I was still made, that wasn't that long ago. Don't it's doubled. Strike. It's doubled. And I was a real estate agent back then. Prices in Marysville went right down the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. I first in Marysville, a high priced house, I've been here for yeah. over 45 years. A high priced house was 60,000. Yeah. <laughs> there were no 100,000 no. homes. Yeah. The, the beautiful home, of course, we right. have the, the hill there, it was all trees. But yeah, <laughs> my house was yeah. 24,000. It's skyrocketed. I mean, I think part of it, part of it is a, a supply and demand problem, right? The, the less supply of housing you have, the more expensive it's going to be. I mean, I've traveled throughout the country and gone into towns where the opposite problem is in place. Everybody's home values are decreasing in places in the Midwest and stuff because everybody's leaving. Yeah. Well, and, you know, here we have everybody coming in and we have a supply problem. Uh, and then you have the Growth Management Act, which you know, kind of pushes everybody into centralized areas. And when that land runs out, you know, it's a, there's definitely a lot that needs to be worked on. Um, I think in conjunction with the state and federal, I know the state legislature is uh, attempting to tackle this problem with some some ideas in this legislative session. I, some of them are a little complicated. I don't know that you'll be completely thrilled with everything coming out of that, but it does increase the supply. It will increase the supply if that goes through. Um, Congresswoman, do you have some thoughts on that? So I think when we look at financing for affordable housing, I brought up the low income housing tax credit. Um, we're trying to expand that so that it's more broadly available. It's not just for building new, um, it's also for refurbishing housing as well. And that's important because to your point, when folks decide that you know, a facility is gonna go away, uh, you know, a development that may have multiple homes, et cetera, it's not like folks just can find another place to live. We need to make sure that those, those places can stay vibrant and up to date. But to be able to refurbish places can be expensive. And this is true in rural communities too. We've seen it in Eastern Snohomish County too. Um, so the, from the federal government, one of the biggest things is to make sure that the financing is available to help make sure that work happens, to, to try to make sure that not only are there more, is there more affordable housing, but also make sure that the affordable housing we do have a is salient point to people who live in manufactured homes is that the financing for manufactured homes is almost non-existent. The interest rates are sky high. You can't qualify for them if it's on a on a, a rented space. They won't they won't finance it. VA won't touch it. You know, um, something needs to be done. It's something that, you know to loosen that up. And the other part is the land, which you talk about, which is part of the, sure. you know, conversation. And this is the the work with local communities too. Is, you know, where can we make sure that affordable housing can be um, is available? Yeah, because so you're a bus line. Mm -hmm. so no, but in the community, not yeah. put everything far away where it's giving it. I think there's been an ongoing effort we to make sure. for six hundred to nine hundred thousand dollar homes. Mm -hmm. We can maybe, uh, Haley, yeah. can we look at, I mean, I don't know. Doesn't the council who, direct the planning commission here? We have, well, the planning commission is a recommending body to the council, but right, the council right. has fine. So yeah, you, yeah. You do direct them to a certain extent. 
Right. The uh, yeah. You need to direct them in a different direction. <laughs> look, Haley, can we look at that particular, um, you said it was bought out? I don't know if they're trying to get a rezone or something, the Carlisle. No, they are trying to get a rezone. Oh, they are. Okay. They are. Okay. Yeah. Oh, they're just trying to raise the prices on you? Oh. Well, I have a friend who lives there. 600 to $1,200. Yeah. New yeah. residents are going to pay 1200 bucks. See, I don't, know what, I don't know what options the city has. On, I mean, we can't price control it. We could, we could not allow them to rezone it, but we can't necessarily control it. So a private business bought it. Yeah, okay, got it. And they're just raising the prices on your particular... Yeah, so you have your... I have a friend there who lives there. And she, too, is okay. looking at the same issue you're looking at, sir. Yeah, she, too. Yeah. And she says, I don't yeah, know there's, there's here, but I can't sell parks it. right in the Maryville area that yeah. have been bought so out. So then they'll keep me out. Of, right, right. And I'll have nothing. Because the company that has bought it says, well, you're not paying our fees, which are going up and up, and... <clears throat> You say, well, I'll try to sell, and maybe I can find a home, you know, a one room or a or a, a very small apartment to live in, maybe. But nobody will finance it because, as you said, they're manufactured housing. So then, what happens to these people is, it may happen that she might just have to walk away because she can't pay the monthly fee that keeps racking up in addition to her mortgage, and she'll have to walk away and and have nothing because she can't sell a manufactured house. So, so it's the fee. Up the it's the fee to have it in the park. Yeah. Have it there okay. in the park. It's not their house. She can handle yeah. the house, house payment. Okay. And she can handle the initial right. when she moved in. Right. The monthly fee. She can handle that one. But not the one that they're trying not to move it to, yeah. Her, 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 okay. Her she still works. Her income is not jumping as high as the Yeah. And and there again it's a private business who has bought it, so I don't know right. what the, our options are. Whether or not, yeah. Councilmember Muller, did you have something? Yeah, I mean, one of the issues we are faced to is that in our state that we don't have a cap on our property taxes, and so we've had these escalated prices. So you could have owned your home for 30 years, your mortgage paid off, but I mean, let it develop you, right? I mean, there are issues, they really feel it down there, because I don't know my mother-in-law's house is, has a teardown worth more than... <laughs> Want to know. Um, and, but she has no tax relief, right? And uh, we really don't have tax. And so people in Marisol, you're right, it was always a, you know, from I've been born and raised here and sold houses back here when we sold them for $35,000. But that same house today is $600,000 and your tax bill is $800 a month and a mortgage payment back then was probably $150 a month. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a real problem in the state. Neither of us control that on either side of this, but I think that's really what, what I see and what I feel from people I talk to are their their tax, their, their annual tax payments or more than they can afford because they've been in their house for 20, 30 years, paid for, but they're $800, $900 a month plus all the other ancillary things that go with it. So I don't know how, I mean, to me, I think it's, if we really want to affect change in that platform, we need to have something that allows people who've been in a home to have some tax relief yeah. when it comes to property taxes, because it's a big number. Yeah. Um, we had some other... I'm going to go off oh. local whenever okay. you're ready to go off local. Can I go? We had one hand here before you, and then we'll come to you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I kind of ran into that a couple of years ago uh, in a rental property also. Luckily, we have a landlord that only has about six or seven units, mm -hmm. but they tried to raise our rent 20% two years in a row. And uh, I'm on Social Security, and I, could, I couldn't even qualify for the house now to rent it. So yep. it's, yeah. I know Social Security isn't going to go up. It needs to go up like not uh, 20%. Bernie Sanders says 2400 bucks a month more. That's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, just regular Social Security, you're below the poverty level. Right, you're not covering the increase no. in inflation, yeah. Mm -hmm. My name is Marilyn Roberts, and as I said, I've lived here in Marysville for over 45 years. You just sound native. <laughs> and um, my issue is, uh, uh, on the federal level, um, would you speak to the move? I hear there's a move from the Biden administration to, um, in regards to the World Health Organization, to bring more and more of um, my health care and the health care of every American citizen under the authority 
of the World Health Organization, and I oppose that. I would like um, the health care of every American citizen, all of us here, and all the rest of our millions, to remain under the um, authority of the United States government. Not anything from the UN, and certainly not the World Health Organization. And I don't want us to be required to have, um, for example, health passports to go from place to place. And um, so that's my issue. And have you heard of it? And what, what have you heard about? So I think a lot of the, a lot of uh, attention came with respect to COVID. Um, there was an international response, public health. No, no, I know, but there was an international public health response to COVID, and the the U.S. was working with the international community and the World Health Organization in an international response to COVID. There is also ongoing international public health efforts to deal with all sorts of uh, challenges that are faced throughout the community, whether it's an individual disease, um, helping make sure um, folks in other countries also have access to important medicines and, uh, and vaccines. So there has been cooperation there and continues to happen. I mean, we decide in the United States, we decide the you know, the drugs that are, you know, the FDA can decide what drugs are approved. Um, we can make our own policy on health care. So that is ours. But when we're talking about participating in a, with the international community on public health, that has been um, part of, of uh, working with. I, I think there's been. I being released very much, but it's being talked about in the Biden administration for sure. And I do not want my health care or anybody's health care controlled by anyone except the government we make, of America. The, and the, the US organization is controlled by Communist China. The, the US makes decisions about US health care. Okay, um, and and so the US makes decisions. And we work with the international community when we're talking about, and we, and, we're, and we work with the international community when we're talking about international public health issues. vote against it if they want to take any authority over my health care and put it under the WHO. The US, the US is in charge of its health care. We, we make our decisions on health care. I'm just saying. I'll call you. Back in the back here. Thank you, Mayor. Robert Pierce, Virgil. I'd uh, just like to state an opinion, please. Yeah. And that's about our post office. It seems to me our city is just about outgrown the post office. <laughs> yeah. and, I'm, and I'm wondering if our old city property just up the street on the other oh. side might not be a good spot for a new post office. Well, we are trying to sell it, so maybe we can reach out and see. <laughs> but that's a good idea. Thank you. And it is, yeah. Uh, it's tough to get in there and get a parking space. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Tanya Cram. I met the mayor a few weeks ago at Maud's house, which is a local women and children's shelter. I appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Um, my day job is I work as a substance abuse counselor. Um, and so I have worked with multiple clients that the yes. Embedded Social Worker Program has brought in. Yeah, thank you. It's, I can't say enough about these programs, whether it's Marysville, the, the sheriffs. I'm really glad the sheriff decided to come back to it. You know, City of Everett, it is a wonderful program. It does do a lot of work. Is it 100%? No. But it's a lot better chance than people left on their own. So I will say thank you very much for that. But my question is for the Congresswoman. Um, you mentioned Housing Hope. Um, we have three women in our shelter and their children um, who have been approved for housing with Housing Hope. One was approved the end of June. One was approved a month or two later, and one was approved in December. Their units are sitting empty. Every three months, they have to requalify. I don't know where the problem is stemming from, but Housing Hopes and HASCO, the Housing Authority of Snohomish County, I don't know whose responsibility it is, but we literally have three women. One has been in the shelter for three years, nearly, um, with her children. Um, who is holding agencies like Housing Hope accountable for those federal dollars? Because, again, the units are sitting empty. They've been approved. So I don't know. I'm happy to follow up. I don't know enough about this particular situation, so we'll follow up. I mean, um, I'll get some more information from you. You know, that's keeping other families from being able to 
access our, our shelter. So. Okay, thank you. So let me know after, or let Rachel or Kelly know, and we can okay. get contact information. No, thank you. And I, uh, in answer to the first question, um, we should point out too, I, I uh, told you about some of the city programs, but there are amazing social service programs in Marysville, all throughout the county. Mod's House was one I just, was such an amazing tour three or four weeks ago, and this particularly helps um, women and children in difficult situations, and, but just seeing how they organize the household and everybody's got some duties and they have the ability to, you know, the kids are in school, one lady was going off to work while we were there. So, you know, Mod's House, Housing Hope, um, and there's others too, but we could go on and on about the kind of privately, private social service entities. So the more you can donate to those, the more you help this problem as well. Yes, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, Aiden Hartman, uh, question about broadband. How is it that you entice companies to build out their infrastructure? Because I know you can't dictate who builds what, when, and where. Um, they need to build more of it. Fiber everywhere. So how do you do that? So are you talking about a particular area that doesn't have coverage right now, or it's not a sufficient? Areas that don't have coverage, an adequate yeah. coverage. Yeah. Everybody's got coverage. Um, well, not everybody has any. Some people don't even have any. That's why I was kind of. We have a few different problems. I think we have to tackle. So with Starlink, um, with satellites, mm -hmm. you can get it anywhere. Uh, but maybe, but affordability can be an issue, correct. right? So. Yes. So but, how is it that you? ensure more people have coverage? So a couple things. One, um, Snohomish County actually did a pretty good, one of the biggest challenges we had was mapping. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody in a county had connectivity, the county was considered to have coverage, yeah. which of course we know is silly. You could be out in Darrington and have nothing and you Sometimes could have some. Right across the street type of situation. Coverage also didn't, I think coverage today needs to be able to do uh, video like a, a Zoom meeting or something like that. So when we talk about what baseline coverage is, that's the definition of baseline coverage now so that you can um, either do remote work or school or whatever issue, but it used to be much slower than the ability to do that. So that's one, and then affordability. So if we take all of those and say, you've got to have sufficient speed, you have to have affordability of coverage and you have to have coverage everywhere. Um, that's really part of the ongoing effort that we were looking for in the federal government. We put dollars in for infrastructure and I know the county did its own mapping and some of you might have participated. The county did a survey um, to try to get more detailed information about coverage throughout the county um, because we know we have rural areas that have basically nothing. We know we have places also where there are issues with speed or affordability. And some places, even in cities, where there really isn't coverage at all for whatever reason. So um, we need to map those out and then we need to tackle them. Some are different ways. Some need infrastructure. They don't have fiber out to those areas. Um, so maybe satellite's your only option, but satellite may be too expensive. So if you look at kind of fiber out to um, eastern parts of the county, that can be one challenge. Other places, it may be private areas within an urban area where, um, where someone said to get lines in there, someone's gonna have to pay because it's not in a public space anymore. Um, and how do, you, how do you put that in? So, I'll, so I say that because there's a few different things that we have to tackle in terms of availability. And a big focus has been on no access or to make sure we're upgrading to minimal access. Um, and that's where dollars are going right so now to projects. That you, that you do that? You say, hey, we'll subsidize it? So, so the dollars that we put in place, basically local governments and local communities ask for those dollars for the projects that they're trying to do to meet those needs. And the federal dollars say, here's money that can be used for for increasing speed or providing basic infrastructure, and then someone applies for those, if they meet the criteria that have been put in place, they can be eligible for those dollars. So, um, so having that map, though, is key, because I do think it seems like a simple thing, but we haven't have it, and the FCC map was not 
up to snuff because it would have said that all of Western Washington had great coverage, which we know wasn't true. Um, my district, the old district, which used to go to the Canadian border from Redmond out to the mountains up to the Canadian border, you know, I used to say we have one of the biggest technology hubs on the globe in my district and an hour away from that part of the district we have folks who don't have cell service or broadband so um, so when we talk about it it's not just in other parts of the country it's right here and we need to tackle each of those scenarios in different ways to make sure there's coverage there are different companies that may be involved there and in some places it's you know public infrastructure that's being put in place okay yeah Excellent. Thank thanks you. thank you what other questions? Yes. Hi, you had teased about um, information about the waterfront development. I'd yeah. like to know what is, um, are there going to be public meetings coming up or maybe you've already held some? Yeah, great question. We have had one public meeting. Um, so, yeah, what we are trying to do, uh, we purchased a lot of property along the waterfront and we've owned some for a long time. We, we purchased it to try and clean it up and we did get uh, some great help from our federal partners with Brownsfield grants. So the problem we had had prior to that is uh, because of all the mill and mill work and contaminants over the years down there several decades ago, it was difficult to get private interest in that property down there because nobody knew it was under the ground and nobody wants to take the risk of having hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars worth of cleanup. So now that the city's been able to purchase it and do some of that cleanup, it's you know, it's a little bit easier for us to now market that. And what we hope, what we hope to get is uh, some entertainment opportunities. Um, we would like to see some, some housing down there as well. Uh, we would also like to see some uh, shopping opportunities that complement the Third Street, uh, you know, some of our core kind of historical shopping areas. And also some, some of it will we plan to retain um, is public space for park an expanded park opportunity kind of on this side. Uh, you know, we have the boat launch and whatnot. We can do some different things along there. So we don't have anything hard and fast we can tell you. We have had some folks come in and meet with us, um, but we're not at liberty to, you know, obviously they haven't signed anything or done anything. As soon as we can share anything as it develops, uh, we will we'll, we'll be excited to do that. But we do hope we're kind of in the phase moving out of the, the years of cleanup and just kind of trotting along to more of an execution phase in the coming years. So the council and I and city staff are working on that. And that's kind of the categories we're looking at though. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, um, first real quick on the broadband issue, a lot of uh, municipalities across the country have decided to treat it as an essential public utility. Mm -hmm. And they have invested and they treat it just like your water bill, sewer bill, the whole bit. And from what I understand, it's worked out very successfully. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of tech country, you know, and I'm sure we've got some entrepreneurs on this council that, you know, could figure this one out. Um, I think it's a great idea. Now, on another tangent, this is probably more up Chief Lawless's alley, is fireworks. And I, I, I don't feel too bad about getting ahead of this. But, the stuff that comes off the reservation is controlled, it requires an ATF permit to even possess. Now, they're trying to get away with it because they don't have to, they're sovereign. But the minute it comes off here, and the minute it goes blowing off in my backyard, it, it's a problem. And, you know, if it's prosecuted at a federal level, it's something like a $10,000 fine and a couple of years in jail. But at a state level, it's $10,000 fine and 364 days in jail. I don't even think we've ever prosecuted anybody for the max, which is Italy, at the max, for the Marysville thing. Why? Well, well, what part is that? And once we have cited individuals, um, so it's a matter of catching up to them, most of the time when we get the call, it's already taken place. And much as we try to proactively put more force out in the field on 4th of July, New Year's, and things like that, it's playing catch up. It's not an excuse. It's just we're trying to do the best we can to catch them in the act. And get people that will actually, if we don't catch them in the act, then we have to get people that are willing to sign a statement to <laughs> testify against them in court. Oh, that's not five statements. <laughs> so we got them all. All right.
We do, um, well, we do have, uh, enforce, we do enforce our fireworks ordinance. It's not, it's not foolproof, particularly on the 4th of July when our officers are running around all over, but I don't remember how many it was, but we did have a number, because we talked about this before the last 4th of July, we're going to, we're not going to do warnings, you know, we've had a lot of time on this, and we, we executed a lot of citations and confiscated fireworks and whatnot. Um, I don't have the number. But yeah, we don't have that. I, it we're, it wasn't over years past, so we'll, we'll continue to get at that. We know it's a community priority. Very difficult to enforce, but, but we do better, I think, every year. And it's, you know, a, a lot of what we hear comes from, uh, you know, you can still hear it over on, on the toilet side where they're free to, to, um, to do that. Yes? Um, I live on 47th and 4th in that area. Yep. Year round, I got stuff going on. Right? And I and I I understand by the time there's a call me, you guys come out, they disperse and they're gone. But just the other night, you know, startles my animals. So. Call, call it in though. I think it's helpful to have it called in, even if they arrive late. Maybe they, if you're having it consistent, they can maybe identify an address where that would get a little easier for us. <laughs> okay. Is it T-Mobile? The Starbucks? There's apartments. I honestly think they're coming from over there. I, I just want to know yeah. what is our police officer staff? Um, are we short any any openings or so what's the ratio? What who do we have? What's the countdown? And what are we looking for? We are still down uh, quite a few officers as we are industry wide. It's not just a Marysville problem. It's not just a, a Snow County or Washington State problem. It's a national, even international problem um, in attracting folks to the, the profession. We're doing better. Um, we still have some openings. We have some folks in the academy. Um, there's quite a long wait for the academy. It's, we just hired someone uh, several weeks ago, and they're not going to get into the academy until after the first of the year. Um, so, from the time that we hire someone to the time that they're out in the field and able to respond to calls on their own, it's taking at least a year if they're not experienced officers. So it's a matter of uh, just catching up with that that void that we and everyone else have, and we're competing with some of the same uh, quality candidates that are out there. So it's, it's difficult right now, um, but uh, we are making some headway. Openings, or does that not really matter for me? Um, uh, We're still responding to our calls. Some of our specialty units, we've had to stand down. But our priority is to get to the 911 calls as they come in and have officers out in the field to, to proactively address situations. So we're down about 30% of our deployment staff. Okay, thank you. So I appreciate everything you guys do. One thing it's important for the community to note, Assistant Chief explained it really well, we have never had this many budgeted police officer positions in the history of the city. Now it's how do you fill those positions. You need, you gotta, it's one thing that for the city council has generously provided the budget for them, but it's another thing to get them in, get them trained, get them on the street. Uh, the state legislature is working on what's some regional academies too, which we, we desperately need regional, or we need, we just need more academies. Um, the waiting list for the academy for all cities is several months, so we need more academies. Hopefully out of this legislative session we'll get that and start chipping and John away. John Lovick's been, yeah. um, it's, we have one for the state, and so the question is could we have some that are regional that might help? Yep. Back here and then over here I think. And then we'll come to you, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. The question in my mind is, how can I help public safety do its job about these fireworks? Take a picture, sign a statement, show up in court. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I own three laundromats, Arlington, Marysville, and Everett. I have no idea where the home is, but that's not what I want to talk about. Yeah. It's up to I-5. You obviously drove into the traffic. <laughs> um, you talked about an exit off I-5 right onto State Avenue. Yep. What's the progress on that? Yeah, so it is, um, you see them mobilizing down under the I-5 down there. That project should start here, um, well, within several months. Max is here. Oh, yeah, Max, do you know what date they're starting to work on yes. that? Uh, Assistant Public Works Director Max Bond. And, yeah, Watchdot is currently working on the uh, 529 interchange. And I think they are going to start um, uh, some dirt work here in about a couple weeks. So, in completion April, date? 
2025 is the completion date, correct? Yeah, the interchange will be probably done next fall, and then the, um, the southbound on ramp. The northbound's a much easier configuration. Southbound's got a twirl up and around. Um, and then you're also getting an extra lane on I-5 between Marine Drive and Everett and so, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so the congressman will get will, will be able to fly up and down there. Then on the freeway northbound, you see the uh, the lanes have been shifted, and that's going to come in the new HOV lane from Everett from the Marine Drive to Marysville. So there's no pullover once that HOV lane goes in. That's it, it's no, temporary right now. It's, there's no pull. Yeah. If you, there's an accident or anything, there's nothing to. Yeah. It, when it's reconfigured, my understanding is there'll be a small. It will be difficult. Yeah, it, it's gonna be you're tight. you're trading on you're trading an extra lane for yeah some yeah. 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 Um, the bridge is gonna be really tight because you know um, widening the bridge is gonna be really expensive. So they they try to stay within that footprint, and then after that they're gonna widen the shoulder and then kind of. Yeah. You know, provide a little bit shoulder. I, 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 I drive it all the time, and I say, if there's an accident, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nowhere to go. <laughs> yes, sir. So I've noticed uh, some trees disappearing and being removed from like every slough from the library. And I'm wondering if that is part of just a long term refurbishment or something, or why those are being removed because they, <coughs> especially like at the library, they offered valuable shade in the summertime. Hmm. They were much nicer to look at than just empty, sure. bulldozed uh, yep. flat lots. But uh, every slew looks like they've replanted just with grass. It's a lot more stark looking now. Okay. It's not nearly as nice looking, but I'm just wondering if there's uh, any long-term plan to maybe plant new things or? Well, th there are, yeah, we do have, uh, I think as a lot of cities have an interest in seeing long-term planting of trees. And actually on our Earth Days uh, celebrations, a lot of time we have community members and groups come out and plant trees. So I'm not, I, I must admit, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure about the library or the, the ones you're referring to, but long-term, yes, we have a huge interest in, for a whole host of reasons in tree planting. And in fact, our city hosts a lot of volunteer groups that'll come out, whether it's at Jennings Park or different areas and do tree plantings, uh, rotary clubs and whatnot. So if you have a group that's interested in that, we'll help facilitate it. And we, we proactively do that as a city too. And yeah, I'd, I'd be more than happy to help plant okay. things if there's a plan to put yep. them in. But I just yeah. don't know if there is or not. Yep. Right now the steps have a hole drilled to, to kill off the, the plant entirely, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, I wasn't aware of that, uh, the, the library one at least. Yes. Um, my question's for you. Um, <clears throat> we have a trap house or a drug house across the street from my from my home, and there's one next to the shelter as well. How do you, s the police are very well aware of both locations. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any suggestions on how we as neighbors can uh, do something about the problems that we're having? Yeah, I will tell you, this is always a difficult one. Our police, you know, we, we, we push it as aggressively as we can legally to try and remove those kind of um, individuals. Uh, from those houses and deal with that. Um, I have right around the corner from where I live, uh, I've had two visits. Uh, one was just about four weeks ago when I went out for a morning jog and Homeland Security was there with our officers rooting, some, rooting these guys out. And so it, it you know, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a concern of the neighborhood. They have to build a case. If, if they're aware of it, I can tell you they're working on it. A lot of times they're working on it with the Snohomish County Drug Task Force, sometimes even Homeland Security if it's a, a bigger issue. Any, the best thing you can do, and Assistant Chief Lawless may want to chime in, but the best thing you can do is call in any suspicious activity the minute you see it at 911. No, you may not wake up the next morning and have the whole problem solved, but it helps them build the case, right? If they're getting a call, I can tell you this, and we're dealing with this in, a, in an area of the city right now where we've had so many calls on a, on an, on a particular unit that we can now move forward under some of our nuisance laws and say, look, to the owner, right? Not necessarily the person running there, maybe not be able to get them on anything. We say, whoever you're running with here has had so many drug ODs and so many issues, you're now a nuisance property, and we're gonna to begin to enforce this under our city ordinance. So calling it in does help. So call 911. Call 911 uh, if you see any suspicious activity. Okay. Keep doing that and what keep informing the police. enforcement too, like well, um, yeah. piled up garbage and things like that. We can. If you see that, let Assistant Chief Lawless know before you leave. Our code enforcement team can go look at that. If that's enforceable today, we'll 
move forward with some I've talked to the owner and it's his daughter. Yeah. If you could let maybe Chief, uh, Chief know I'll that. I'll talk to you. Yeah. Thank I you. Can give a, I can give you a bunch of my business they cards. Do you think you can get assessments? Let me know about the house. We have a yeah. house in Everett, my first house to remodel. Yeah. And it's a neighborhood organization. And we go to these meetings and constantly complain about this. It was a drug house. had photographs. had license plate number. On and on and on. It went on for two years. Finally, the house got raided, got busted, and the undercover police officer who was in the house showed up at our meeting. And you would not have recognized how he was undercover and how he presented himself at our meeting. Yeah. And he said, thanks for all the info. That helped us so much. Just, so the more info you give them, yep. and that just, that all of us is like, wow. Yeah, it's so true. Even the one in our neighborhood, um, I know my, because I lived there, my neighbors were, you know, in, they were started talking to me about it over, it was a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. And then they're texting me that morning, guess what, they're here, they're pulling them out. It, it takes time, you know, but, but, and it's unfortunate, but we have to build a legal case. It does us no good to pull them out and have the judge release them and they're back in here a, a day later. Uh, my name's Maria, and um, for the Department of um, Transportation, I am very, very, very grateful for shoulders, because I was in a breakdown and I had enough shoulder to stop safely and I'm alive. So I'm very happy for shoulders. Um, and second, um, about drugs. Um, I've been to a few of the um, Marysville School District meetings and there was in their agenda about medical marijuana for students on school property um, in the bus at school events. And I was concerned and I haven't done a whole lot of homework on it but it's in the second reading, and um, the school board meeting is um, um, Monday. Um, Coming and up. so, I was t talking about drugs and stuff, and so the, I mean, the 2021 20, plus, but then now it's going to medical marijuana for um, under 21, so I'm concerned, and I, I am opposed to, um, to that, especially for for minors or even 21, and I, I believe there's um, lots of therapies like the embedded um, the social workers, but there's lots of therapies available, um, like even equine therapy, art therapy, that will help students yeah. in Santa America. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. School board would be a good, I guess if you're interested in that, attend that school board meeting would be a good, good idea. Thank you for that information. Appreciate that. I was going to piggyback on your comments, and I was going to ask our council, because I don't know any of the policies or how, this, how these things happen, but um, talking about an urban canopy, and that's, and I'm sure you've been in the Congress about how you can give funds to communities to build an urban canopy, not just our wonderful majestic evergreens, but you need to have some deciduous trees in order to have a canopy. <laughs> but I've noticed that some of our new um, apartments that have been springing up here and there have no trees, none. I've noticed that the big one over there in Everett, where the Kmart used to be, has zero trees planted. So I'm wondering, is there something that, um, as you at our federal government level or our council, can you start writing into it if a developer says, I bought this lot, I knocked down the house, I want to put up you know, 20 apartments here where there used to be one family, and um, I'm not going to provide any parking hardly, and uh, can you please require them to plant some trees that will actually be canopy trees, not a pretty little flowery thing that's a stick. <laughs> so well, what are y'all doing for that? And yeah. we can help from the federal government. Do you want to start and then I'll... Well, yeah. I, um, most of the decisions in terms of you know, local planning or local government, there are resources that the federal government um, gives out, usually grant types of programs to uh, for folks who want to either because create... Create right. We're going to create open spaces. We also have resources that folks are doing for conservation, for salmon habitat, because lots of times that cover too over our waterways helps cool down the water and is better for our salmon. Well, it depends on where. You, no, but I, I agree. But you know, here we have part of the town um, right next to the water. There are places where different resources might help um, in different ways. But 
I think the original decision on kind of what size a building can be on a lot, et cetera, a lot of those are made by local government in terms of those types of decisions. Yeah, well, no, you, no, well, yeah, no, you're in the right. Start yeah, requiring things instead we, of just throw up we can do we can do certain things. Um, yeah, I mean you have to provide. A, I mean it is private property. There has to be a nexus to something. But Haley, maybe we can look at that with the council and you and I. I don't know exactly what our tree requirements are for multifamily and whatnot, and I don't know that we have time because it's past six thirty to go through it entirely here. But we can take a look at that and well, and I'm get you some information. It, it's a good feedback. Walking, yeah, and and you know making our. Yep. Uh, even away from the water, mm -hmm. <laughs> making it cool we, and safer. Yeah. And you guys, I mean, not you guys, doesn't our city set the rules that the developers have to meet? Yes, to a, to a degree. To Again, a degree. like I said, sometimes we're, we're superseded by, um, by state law. Okay. Um, you know, Growth Management Act's a good example of that, right? We can't do whatever we want, but we do have, yes, we do have development standards that we can put in place. Growth Management Act that was, I don't know, is it 20 years old now? 30, I think, 30 yeah. 30 years old. Needs to be amended well, yeah, that, make more space for urban canopy. Right. <laughs> that's a, a larger conversation. But yeah, but we do we do have development standards that we can look at. And I know we have a lot of those. I just, I don't know particularly what it is on okay. trees. But we'll take a look at that. Well, thank you. We have a, any last questions for Congresswoman Del Benny while she's here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, as you know, Marysville is very impacted by the I was curious, just with a lot of recent events, um, any discussions that are happening at the federal level regarding rail safety, mm -hmm. so, including one that happened, you know, just in our right area. up at by the Swinomish. Um, um, and we've had others, Custer, we had a day enrollment a few years ago there, and um, and obviously just the movement of traffic generally in terms of blocking roads, hence yep. uh, overpasses. <laughs> uh, um, Blaine has had issues because trains have to go slowly when they're scanned going across the border, and that causes um, has caused huge backups. But all the way through, um, it's been an ongoing challenge. But on safety, um, absolutely uh, ongoing conversation, not just here, but what we saw happen in Ohio and East Palestine, et cetera, has highlighted a lot of the impacts of, um, of making sure not only the rails are safe, but the cars themselves, especially if they're carrying hazardous materials, are safe. Um, because the whole point is you want to make sure that you're not going to have uh, um, something leak out. You want something to be protected as much as possible um, in case of any type of accident. But number one, you don't want there to be accidents. So there will be um, an ongoing conversation there in Congress. Uh, it'll start with the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and, and conversations on that. And there's been more kind of work to just investigate what has happened so people have data on what might have caused these, what types of things to be done to prevent these types of accidents, whether it's on the cars themselves, whether it's on the, the tracks, or, or combinations of that, um, what, can what can be done to improve safety across. And it may be slightly different things in different regions depending on um, what's happened, but absolutely it's a huge priority and should continue to be one. Thank you. Very much. Do yeah. you oversee safety for trains? What? Who oversees safety for trains? So it is, there's a federal, the federal government plays a big role there um, because it's interstate, right? Um, so things like you might have heard there's a lot of conversation because we have a lot of trains going up to our refineries um, recover, that are um, carrying um, crude oil, Thanks. right? So oil trains and making sure that the upgrading the, the requirements for the tankers that carried them was an important conversation we're having. So it's the cars themselves and the safety level there. It's the tracks. Agency? What? Which agency oversees the safety for trains? So there's, in the committee, it's transportation infrastructure, but we have folks who are, you know, we have um, folks focused just on rail alone. So that's going to be um, the FRA and others will be looking at that. But there's different places that can have an impact um, to make sure we're, and in fact, Congressman Larson, who's the top Democrat on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, has been, and now it's his district where the Swinomish train um, derailed, I know, has been looking into that, um, that case in particular on, on what happened. But yes, it is a federal issue and something we're looking at right now to, to understand what we can do 
given all the data that we've seen um, recently with derailments and the accidents that have happened and the impacts on the community. Any last questions? Yeah. Hi, thanks. I don't have a question, but I do have an ask. I'm Robin Sparks, and I'm a legislative ambassador for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, and I'm also the director of the C-Suite uh, Center for Hope Marysville. We're a cancer resource center community model. And um, on behalf of the American Cancer Society, I want to thank you for all of the support that you've given us, um, especially with the, uh, the Medicare Multi-Cancer uh, early Detection and Prevention Screening Act. That's absolutely wonderful. And you just, you've, you've kept it going in the right direction for us. But of course the ask is, and I think you know where this is going, we're going to be asking for increased funding this year for cancer research and prevention. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a lot of wonderful work here in the state legislature. We just passed um, unanimously in the House and just passed the Senate um, a bill for uh, putting restrictions on um, health insurance companies for uh, pre-authorizations. And as a cancer survivor myself, that meant a lot because I, um, I had to postpone some treatments because of that. Um, it's, uh, we're getting just amazing support. Mayor Naring um, has uh, really been the wind beneath my wings for uh, getting cancer, uh, cancer support going here in Marysville and the state legislature and federal government. And just, uh, we just really feel like there's a great partnership with all of you, and I want to thank you. No. Um, well, first of all, I, uh, I think we've made incredible breakthroughs in cancer research recently, even right here in our region. But there's much more to do. We've got to make sure funding is there. I, I'm one of the folks who lead the letter every year asking for increased funding for the NIH. A lot of that goes to many things, but cancer research is a big part of that. Um, I've also led the effort on prior authorization, um, prior authorization because we know many people have been denied care, delayed care. This is with respect to Medicare Advantage that I'm talking about at the federal level because folks are told they have to wait to get approval for a common procedure in many cases and a surgery might be delayed or um, which is healthcare delayed. So we have legislation um, that actually passed the House of Representatives last Congress unanimously, I will say, um, to ask for crazy things like people to have to use electronic um, electronic uh, authorizations as opposed to making people fax things, because um, they still do. So insurance companies shouldn't require a fax, they should let it be done electronically. If it's a common procedure, it should be approved. Um, we also want data on what's approved and what's not, so we can understand if people are being denied care for, for um, for no reason. Um, and there is actually the, the US Department of Health and Human Services has been doing work to streamline the rules so that we can, um, we can make sure that things are moving more quickly. So prior authorization at the federal level is also a top priority. But, but. Thank you. Can I talk about health care for just a second? We got, we're, we're got a council meeting coming up, so we, and I want to give a quick wrap up for both of us. But go ahead if it's really, really quick. Yeah. Uh, our government runs one of the most efficient healthcare uh, systems in the world. That being the, the Veterans yeah. Administration. I'm a veteran. I get my health care there. I don't get delays. I get the best of care. If I get put in an ambulance and they try taking me to a public hospital, I will scream bloody murder. No, you will not. Um, we have the model. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's right there. It works. It's great health care. And it's a whole lot cheaper than what this corporate crap has given us. So thank you. Why not? Thank you. And thank you for your service. Well, we've gone a little over, which is time well spent. But I would <laughs> like to give, I, have, I do have a couple comments I'd like to make in closing. Yeah. But I want to give Congresswoman Del Benny a, a, a couple yeah. moments, too, to, to say anything so she wants. Please, we'll follow up um, with a couple things. But no, if you have questions, um, things that we didn't talk about right now, I'm happy to follow up. Like I said, Kelly and Rachel are here. We can gather um, anything that you might um, need an answer to or a question you might have for us that you didn't want to share with the group. Um, also, it doesn't have to be in a, in a place like this. We're, my office is in Kirkland, but the website is there. You can um, reach out anytime. So um, please do. 
And we also have a, I have a um, newsletter that we send out an email that also can update you on other events that we might have coming up, et cetera. So another way that we can stay in touch. But um, thanks for letting me join you a little bit today. Oh, and, yeah. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I want to thank the congresswoman for coming. Um, uh, it really is. You know, she only has limited time in these recesses, so I appreciate her spending an evening with us. And I wanted to just close by saying thank you all for coming. You make these coffee clashes what they are. Look for another one that will be coming. And also, I think it's good for citizens uh, to see. I know the council and I talk about this. There's an incredible amount of collaboration that goes on between your elected officials at the local level and the state and the federal level. The interchange question we had, that never happens without partnerships with state and federal uh, leaders. The 116th interchange that happened doesn't happen. The 156th that's coming down the road. We have over $200 million of infrastructure investments um, that started back in 2017, I think, going through 2031, that are all collaboration between local, state, and federal government. And so, particularly this time of year, the council and I spend an enormous amount of time working with our state elected officials and our federal elected officials, uh, like Congresswoman Del Bene, presenting um, you know, our situation and, and what we need, and then they spend an enormous amount of time reviewing that. And of course, they don't register represent Marysville, reviewing it for all across. And then we, that's where resources get put into place. So it's, a, it's an important thing, and I think sometimes in this climate we're in, people lose the um, understanding of where collaboration takes communities, right? With no collaboration, you're gonna live in a community that, that just doesn't solve your problems. That's just the honest truth. And so I think a lot of us in elected office are trying to move back to solving problems. And that's what I've appreciated uh, yes. my relationship and partnership with Congresswoman Del Bene is it's about solving problems. Everything from the pothole to the housing, you know, and, and have we solved them all? No, but that's, that's the intention. So we do have some infrastructure going in. We do have a number of things that are working. We've got a whole lot to work on. So anyway, just wanted to throw that out. Thanks all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. And Thanks for all you're it. doing and for having this forum. Yeah, thank you. Uh, although I didn't see the coffee as the coffee class. It's out there. <laughs> I was laughing. There's coffee and cookies still out there. Yeah, take it. <laughs> take some for the room.